behalf of the Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome everyone to this unique event. Uh, in particular, I'd like to recognize the presence of Rabbi Strachler's uh, childhood Rebetzin, uh, Rebetzin Marcus of Congregation AABJD. Rabbi Adler, it's so good that you can make it in person, and may you have a continued and speedy refuah shlema from your recent injury. And now we transition to a new stage in the history of our shul under the guidance and leadership of Rabbi Chaim Strachler. Rabbi Strachler has already demonstrated his leadership and shown us many of his outstanding qualities. We look forward to many, many more years of learning from him and being inspired by him. The program this morning is as follows. We will begin with some words from our president, Bina Faber. Bina has tirelessly led our shul for two and a half years, dealing with unprecedented challenges, particularly those brought on by the COVID pandemic. We will then be honored this morning to, to be hearing from three distinguished rabbis. We will first be hearing Divrei Bracha from Rabbi Adler. R Rabbi Adler will be followed by Rabbi Moshe Tarragon, Ram at Yeshivat Haritzion. Rabbi Tarragon has been a regular visitor and speaker at our shul. He has had a long-standing relationship with Rabbi Strachler, stretching back to the three years that Rabbi Strachler spent learning at the Gush. It is a great kavod for both Rabbi Strachler and our shul that he has come to us from Israel to mark this momentous occasion. We will then hear from our own, our own shul member, Rabbi J.J. Schachter. Rabbi Schachter, who we all know is both a friend and as a force in the American rabbinate, has known Rabbi Strachler for close to two decades. And finally, of course, we will be addressed by our new Mora de Asra, Rabbi Strachler, and we will have concluding words from our new assemblyman elect, uh, Mrs. Ms. Sema Semi Heider. Um, I trust that you will find today's program to be both meaningful and memorable. And now I'd like to ask Bina to come up for her remarks. Rabbis, members, and honored guests, this is an exciting day in Renat's history as we officially install Rabbi Strachler as our new Rav. Since coming to Renat, Rabbi Strachler has made an impact on so many with his warmth, shirim, and genuine care for all members of the shul. Today we honor the history of Renat and the new chapter on which we are embarking. Renat prides itself on a membership that values serious tefillah and learning, and we are thrilled to have Rabbi Strauchler take the helm. His love for teaching, learning, and inspiring, and connecting with all members of the community in ways, in many ways, is what has already drawn so many to him. As our beloved Renat begins a new chapter, we look forward to enjoying the Torah and genuine care Rabbi Strauchler has to offer. Over the past few months, I've come to hear the many ways Rabbi Strachler has already impacted so many in our Kihila. Many members have commented how inspiring the Rabbi Shirim, Divrei Halacha, and Drashot have been, and how they look forward to hearing and learning from him. Others have noted how Rabbi Strauchler has responded to questions, often picking up the phone and speaking with the questioner to better understand the family and their particular situation or how he's reached out when they were dealing with an illness or a surgery, and how he's reached out when they were just having any issue that they needed. Some have appreciated Rabbi Strauchler's comforting presence during the sad times, particularly the way he was able to connect with children when the family suffered a loss. Others have enjoyed the opportunity to get to know the rabbi at a variety of shul events. He's joined our families in a range of activities, from preparing packages for the food pantry to a spiritually uplifting Friday night tish, from Laka Fest to planting tulips. And of course, this is just the beginning. I would be remiss if I, if I did not take this opportunity to thank Ari Mermelstein and the members of the search committee, 
Ari helped assemble a diverse and talented group designed to reflect the demographics of our membership, and together they invested countless of hours in the process. The thought, care, and insight with which Ari and the rest of the committee approached their task is a testament to our shul, our mission, and our membership's focus on halacha. It gives me great pleasure to officially welcome Rabbi Strachler as the Rabbi of Renat. And now I'd like to take this opportunity to ask our Rabbi Emeritus, Rabbi Yosef Adler, to share some words of Torah in this honor. Thank you very much, Bina. I apologize to those who are sitting on the other side of the mechitza. It's a little difficult to stand, um, but I hope you'll be able to hear my remarks, my remarks uh, as if you were sitting right here in front of me. I want to uh, extend my own personal mazel tov, myself on behalf of Cheryl as well, to Rabbi and Mrs. Strachler upon uh, making this very significant transition from Toronto to Teaneck. And I am sure uh, that you're going to make your own imprint um, in your, uh, your own style in trying to continue to lead Renat going forward. One brief thought. At the end of last week's Parsha, in the only meeting between Paro and Yaakov, Paro asks Yaakov, how old are you? How old are you? So he tells him, Mea Ushlo Shimu Mea, 130 years, Meat Veraim. They're not that long. I'm not reaching my parents' or grandfather's age. My father, Yitzchak, died at 180. Abraham died at 175, and I'm only 130, and I feel like my life is coming to an end. And indeed, he only lived 147 years. But he describes them as. Me'at vira'im. Imagine somebody asks you, how old are you? And you tell them what your age is, 55, 70, whatever it is. And then you add, my life has been terrible. That's the only thing he said. Me'at vira'im. And indeed, the Midrash claims that the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that Yaakov would not live as long as his uh, father or grandfather was because of this particular statement. He couldn't think of anything positive in the last 130 years. He was blessed with 13 children. Couldn't have been all Ra'im. He was blessed with the opportunity to defeat Esav. He overcame the challenges of Lavan. How can he leave the impression with Paro that my whole 130 years were Ra'im? And indeed, as I said, the Medrash uh, states that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not happy and he decided to shorten Yaakov's life to only 147 years. Too many people look negatively at what has happened during the course of their lifetime and fail to identify the wonderful opportunities that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has granted them. And unfortunately, this applies within a shul as well. I imagine that I have been the discussion of several thousand Shabbatot lunches. What a crummy drush that was. Where does he have the nerve to give us Musa like that? Okay. No one ever said I was perfect. I never said that. No one else ever said that. However, I imagine there are some positive things that I brought to the shul. But some people only look at me'at vira'im. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not like that at all. Rabbi Strachler has a lot of good to bring to this kihila in a variety of ways. I ask everybody here, and you'll share this with anybody who's not here, let us not follow Yaakov's example here by simply stating me'at but rather 
take the opportunity to think and identify the positive ways in which Rabbi Strachler has impacted our lives thus far and will continue to do for many years to come. So as I offer divrei bracha of good health and um, wonderful opportunities to respond to the broad myriad problems that arise in a typical shul day uh, to both Avital and Rabbi Chaim, please, Rabbi respond in a fashion which will please HaKadosh Baruch Hu to say, maybe Ma'at might be Rav a lot of years, but there were plenty of good amidst the Ra'im. And as a result, Rabbi Strachel will have your backing, your support, as he continues to spread the message of Rinat. Thank you. Okay, good morning. It's absolutely an honor to stand here. Anytime I walk into this building, I feel honored to be in your presence. I feel honored to be in the presence of such esteemed rabbis who I've learned so much from. And the presence honors me. But I have to tell you, you have the wrong guy. They're one of Rabbi Strachler's Rebbe. I taught him nothing. I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> Showing a speech in history. Stop smiling. <laughs> I met now, this young man 27 years ago, like to almost hear, to the day. We wanted to hear from Rabbi Tarragon. I think over the last 27 years, it's hard to imagine anything I taught you. He spent three years in our yeshiva, but about three minutes in my shir, if, if that much. So it's hard for me to imagine what I taught you. So the Gemara in Erevin talks about a relationship of such. The context of the Gemara in Erevin is, is a halacha, you should show your shchita knife to a Talmud Chacham and... You shouldn't be the Talmud Chacham inspecting the, the ritual slaughter knife if there are people greater than you. So at some point, Rav Luna says, even though I'm a Talmud, he says, I am a Talmud Chaver. What is a Talmud Chaver? I'm a Chacham, but uh, that person taught me one thing. Lamad Davar Echad. So I stand here not as Rav Strachlo's rabbi or Rav. I'd like, I hope that we're maybe Talmud Chavers. Maybe I taught you something. It's hard for me to imagine what I taught you. But let me tell you what you taught me. See, there are certain gifts that Kodesh Baruch Hu bestows us naturally. Heaven imparts us with gifts. Nothing to be proud about. Those are divinely ordained. It's who we become and how we grow as people, how we complement those gifts alongside of our natural gifts. So let me tell you the young man I've seen over the last 27 years and I've been amazed by. Because this was a man, this was a boy, 17-year-old, with almost irrepressible intellectual thirst. Uncanny rigor, the ability to sit and learn and study, mental discipline. But that was his world, the world of ideas, and of course of sacred ideas, the world of Torah. And you had advanced precociously, that's why I met you. Sometimes you interview a student for your shiva, you're a little intimidated. <laughs> you should be interviewing me. But since then, in addition to that, and you've developed those tools and employed those tools, this is what I'm amazed by. I'm amazed, Rav Chaim, by your humility. And I'm amazed by your humility on two levels. Personal and intellectual. First of all, personal humility. How do people with talent and achievement achieve humility? The easiest route to humility is self-denial, but it's counterproductive and it's self-suffocating. How do you achieve humility, generally? Generally, the route to humility is perspective. You have accomplishments, you have talents, you have traits. But there are people greater than you. There are others with talents. They were endowed by Kurdish Baruch Hu. They should be missionized rather than weaponized. So you put things into perspective. That's why it's so important to meet great people in this world, as people say, to get over yourself. Oh, that person has already gotten over himself. Baruch Chaim, I think that your humility is based on you're simply oblivious. <laughs> I don't think you know what you're accomplished. You're hiring a very naive rabbi. Now that sound, may sound ominous, but at least in the moral field, it works. I really don't think that Rabbi Strachler is aware of all of his accomplishments. I'm jealous, because that's very, very rare. And it comes from an inner purity of parents and in-laws and family, and of course, Avital, the nurse of your cell. And I know that. Don't think I don't know that. 
And I'm also amazed by your intellectual humility. You know so much, and you've read so much, and you've studied so much, but there's a thirst for input, there's a thirst for knowledge, and there's a thirst for course correction. You don't double down on your errors. I've seen you course correct a lot. It's very easy to plateau in life when you reach a certain level of accomplishment and you start doubling down on your mistakes. You dig your heels in, and I'm right, even though I'm wrong, and don't confuse me with the facts. Great people learn how to course correct. And you're an excellent course corrector, and your intellectual thirst is very holistic. Of course it comes from our Torah and our Masora, but it comes from such a broad range of interests. It's very holistic. And I think you enjoy and appreciate great ideas expressed by noble minds throughout the centuries, whether they live within our tradition or they operate outside of our tradition. And it's because you're humble, and I believe that that is the gift you took from our Rebbe, Moreno Verabeno Revaron Lichtenstein, Zechot Zadik Levracha, who had so many traits and so many characteristics. But if you're looking for the core pivot trait, it was indescribable humility. Ekev Anava Yiras Hashem. I've also been inspired watching you become a real people person. I never would have expected that. That's not meant to be an insult. <laughs> That'd be a compliment. <laughs> oh boy, I'm getting, getting sticking my foot in my mouth. Such a people person. I mean, your world was the world of ideas and the world of knowledge and the world of wisdom. And someone, I'm sure, with Avital and with your children or Mishpacha, the amount of time you invest in relationships and in people. And not just the amount of time you invest, but the authenticity and the care. You know when people are talking to you, and you know when people are talking through you. You can smell authenticity a mile away. And you're just extremely authentic. People sense that. They sense that you care, that you're in the moment, you're mindful of their relationship. You're not, mine isn't racing elsewhere, but you're looking at them and investing in them. As was mentioned before during the crisis, and Ashrechem v'tov lachem. And the amount of time you spend during Shiva, and I'm just amazed at who you've become. They say about the Chafetz Chaim, it's too bad he was such a tzaddik, because when you think about the Chafetz Chaim, he was the most, most saintly Jewish person of the 19th century. Because if he weren't such a saint, you'd realize how much of a scholar he was, how much of a Tamil Chacham he was. But his saintliness overshadowed and obscured his scholarship. When you read the Bir Halacha, you see the greatest Tamil Chacham of his era. Sometimes people have such powerful traits that are so clearly identifiable and they leap off of the page, you don't realize there are other traits. So this is your Chafetz Chaim moment. Everyone knows the Rhodes Scholars and the intellect and the accomplishments and the valedictorian and put all that aside. Relationships, not accomplishments. Relationships, not accomplishments. And you, Baruch Hashem, have sky high. I don't care how high your IQ is. Your EQ is sky high. And it's so much more important. And this is the person you're receiving. A gift. Cherish that gift. Let it be a world of respect, not rancor. As Rabbi Adler said, let it be a shul of partnership, not partisanship. Of solidarity, not strife. And know your place in history. As was mentioned before, this is a unique shul. I'm a visitor, so I can see it from a different perspective. I see it from 10,000 feet up, literally, as I'm landing in Newark. You need outsiders to give you perspective. This is a shul that's renowned. It's a shul that's not just a name, but it's a genre. People say, oh, I dive in an arena like shul. It's something when you become a genre. Like in Israel, if you ask someone for a Steinzeltz, they'll give you a Hebrew art school. Steinzeltz has become a, a type name rather than a, a work or a corpus. So let's build a Renat shul. And you're well known for rigorous Torah study, fervent prayer, social consciousness, which is why it's so important that you're here. The people in this room, I can't say this any other way, they're your best citizens. These are the salt of the earth. These are the people who dream of their homeland, but are willing partners in this experiment of building the city on the hill. If you're looking for partners, they're right here. Come every Sunday. Make your job a lot easier. <laughs> they're here to help. They're here to build. They're here to respect law. They're here to respect people. They're here to build solidarity. And this shul is the core of that. But there are two parts of this shul that have caught my eye throughout the years. And I hope and I pray that they'll continue to course through this shul. Over the last 200 years, there's been a shift of gravity, a shift of spiritual gravity from the community to the yeshivas. In the Ashkenazi world, we've seen a supernova, 
an explosion of great yeshivas, starting from the European theater, and I'm sure Vashachter knows a lot more about this than I do, and you can comment on it, the European theater, and now in the American yeshivas, and the all-stars, the rock stars of this movement are Russia yeshiva, and all the energy are in the yeshivas. And what did the Rebbe Chanan say? What did Rebbe Chaim say in the yeshiva? And what did the Rav say in yeshiva? What did Rav Aaron Cutler say in yeshiva? What happens in shuls and communities? Eh, it's balabatish with derision. Eh, the balabatim. That's how they think. And maybe they have a shir in, uh, in Yaakov. Or maybe if they're more adept, a shir in Mishnah Brura. But all the energy lies elsewhere. This is an amazing correction. Through Rabbi Adler's leadership and your commitment, this has become a base medrash katan. Not just in terms of the type of learning that takes place, but I hate to say it, this has become, has become an outpost of Rabbi Soloveitchik. I can't say it any other way. People feel that they come here who never met Rabbi Soloveitchik, never learned with Rabbi Soloveitchik, in addition to those who have continued. And I've spoken to so many people. What I appreciate about the shul is I learned in that yeshiva 20 years ago. I learned in this yeshiva. But in this shul, I was exposed to the Rav and, of course, his Talmidim. It's an incredible accomplishment, not just to create a base Knesset that has rigorous Torah learning, but essentially to recreate or reposition what's happening today in the yeshiva world and moving it here, moving it into a communal setting. Stupendous accomplishment. The second part in which I think Yeshua excels is that with our return to our homeland and our resurrection of national identity, there's also been a rediscovery of certain parts of Torah that had been neglected in the past that are unique to the land of Israel, that are starting to bubble and evolve in our land. And very often they don't backwash into America. There's a bit of a, I don't know if the word autism is inappropriate, where there's, there's a bit of a compartmentalization between the Torah in America and the Torah in Eretz Yisrael. The most obvious Torah that Eretz Yisrael is starting to uncover is the rediscovery of meta-analysis of Tanakh, to study Tanakh in large and whole sections rather than deconstructionist reduction. There's been a reunion of academic study. Of course, academic study of Jewish sources is not an Israeli phenomenon, but it has become wedded to the Israeli imagination. The emergence of Hasidus and Kabbalah, postmodernist Torah, Rav Shagar. And this, this is the Torah that my sons are studying and my Talmudim are studying. And when you walk in America, you rarely, rarely find its echo. You rarely find people that are converted. Not in this building. Through all of your leadership and all of your intellectual thirst, this building has become not just a host for the Torah of the Rav from Washington Heights, but it's become an achsanya for Eretz Yisrael. It's literally become an achsanya for the backwash of Torah's Eretz Yisrael. And you should be proud. And you stand for something. And make sure as the community changes, I lived through communal changes. I grew up in Flopwish in the 70s. It's a very different place now. Communities change, and you have to be nimble to maintain your traditionalism, but adapt and find ways to meet and accommodate changes in the community, to retain your spirit. It's not easy. You have great leadership. I'll just end with a story. I apologize, because I see there's a big buffet downstairs. So. When they opened the Yeshiva of Velazhin, great, fantastic success. Sir so Chaim was once speaking to a friend of his, of Zarman Mogolis. Mate Ephraim, the base of Ephraim. Evidently, he also started yeshiva, but it belly flopped. Velazhin took off, meteoric. Reb Zalman Margolis yeshiva, not so much. Reb Zalman asked Reb Chaim, how come your yeshiva was so successful? Mine tanked. Reb Chaim said, what did you do the first day you opened your yeshiva? Reb Zalman said, the first day we opened yeshiva, we had a party, a chagiga, we danced, we sang, we had a suddhas mitzvah. Reb Chaim said, the day we opened Velazhin, we had a tiny tzivor. We fasted and we davened for siyat deshmaya. So don't take that literally. <laughs> okay, last time I'm invited back here, but today you're davening with all the excitement and all the fireworks and pyrotechnics of the day. Shema koleinu Hashem alokeinu. No human convention, no human journey will ever succeed without the blessing of the Kodesh Baruch Hu, without his approval. So today during Shema koleinu say, we're starting something new. We seem to be on track. We have great leadership. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hodel Lashem Kitov, Ana Hashem Hashiyana.
And now I'd like to ask Rabbi J.J. Schachter to step forward. What a Yom Tev we celebrate in our shul today. Baruch Shechianu V'Kiyamanu V'Giyanu Lazman Azeh. A Yom Tev in the life of our wonderful congregation, our Kihila, Congregation Rinat Yisrael, and a Yom Tev in the lives of our new illustrious rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Strachler, Avital, Avital, there you are, okay, good. Avital and their children and for all the members of their families who are gathered here for this very special Simcha. We gather to celebrate our new Rav, our new Marad Asra, to whom we look to build on the legacy of Rabbi Adler, who has led our shul with extraordinary distinction for over four decades, to work together with Rabbi Wiener, who blesses us for the last number of years, and to put his own stamp on our shul and our community. Mipnei ma zacha Yehuda lamalchus. The Tosefta at the end of Brachas wants to know why is it that Yehuda was the one who merited kingship? What does it take to be a leader? What zechusim do you need to have? What actions have you already had to do to engage in in order to merit the mantle of leadership? And the Tosefta gives a number of answers. I want to focus on the last one. Amar Rabbi Akiva mipnei ma zocha Yehuda lemalchus mipnei shekidesh shemo shel hakadosh baruch hu shekisha olu shvatim vaamdu alayam. When that fateful moment came, when they were at the sea, the raging water in front of them, and the hordes of Paro and his armies in pursuit behind them. There's a disagreement. Some say that each one of the Shvatim wanted to jump in. I want to jump in. I want to jump in. More likely is the other version. What? I'm going to jump in. I'm not so chashev. You should jump in. No, you should jump in. Nobody wanted to jump in. Kafatz, Shifto Shel Yehuda, Veyorad Betchila Liam. Yehuda jumped in. Nachshon Ben Aminodov jumped in. You want to know why Yehuda Zeichel Amalchus? Mepnei Shekidei Shemoshe Lakadosh Baruch. Do you want to merit leadership? What do you need to have to be a leader? You act in a way. That's Makade Shem Shamayim. By jumping in to help, sometimes it's physical. Sometimes they need chizuk. Sometimes they're in danger. Sometimes they're in trouble. Sometimes it's Ben Adam Lachavero. You need chizuk. You need to help people get out of a difficult situation. And you're the first one in. And you're the one who extends yourself. You want to be Zochel Lamalchus, you Makade Shem Shamayim, Ben Adam Lachavero. And sometimes you makade shem shamayim, benodam lamokom, where people need spiritual assistance. When you jump in and you want to teach and you want to inspire and you want to lead and you want to be a religious role model and you want to be a manig Yisrael and you want to be a marbitz Torah and you want to follow in the footsteps of the Rabboni Shalom himself and be a malame Torah Lamo Yisrael. You want to be a leader, you distinguish yourself, you extend yourself, and you become someone who is a role model for others in all of these different ways. How fortunate we are in our Kehillah, how fortunate I am in Yocheved, our family, we're members here. We're thrilled to be members here. I'm not a guest speaker at someone else's installation. This is my family, this is my rabbi. Just on Thursday, we had a group of Rabbanim who got together. It was on Zoom. I saw Rabbi Strachler and I said, Bershus Mori for Rabbi. All the rabbis are wondering what's going on. He's my rabbi, and it's a thrill that he's my rabbi. I speak for myself, for our family, and for our entire Kehillah, how fortunate we are 
that we have been zoche to be blessed with such an outstanding Marada Asra who has already distinguished himself as a premier Mekade Shem Shamai. At Yeshiva University, Kukin Fellow, a Golding Scholar, and then beyond, a Wexner Graduate Fellow, a Rhodes Scholar, who has a Master's in Religious Studies and a Diploma in Theology from Oxford University. I don't know anyone else. I've been around the block. I don't know anyone in this world who has achieved that. That's extraordinary. It's amazing, and that's only the extra bonus on top of what it is that Rabbi Strachler represents, who comes to us after successful careers in the Rabbanis in Connecticut and Toronto, who comes to us with an outstanding, stellar, national and international reputation as a leader, as a leader in the Rabbinical Council of America, as a leader in its uh, journal in tradition, who has distinguished himself, and we've seen it, Ben Adam Lachavero, kind and thoughtful and sensitive and caring, Ben Adam Lamakom, as a teacher, as a preacher, as a Magid Shir, and we have seen this as well. Baruch Shechiyanu Vikiyamanu Vihigiyanu Lazman Hazeh. And we're blessed with Avital, kind and thoughtful and gracious and learned. You are a real partner in Reb Chaim's work. And we are grateful to you, to you, Avital, for co-leading our Kehila, for joining us, and for being a co-leader with your exceptional husband. And we welcome Adir and Tehila and Atara and Svi and Frida. Yeah, I know you're children of the rabbi. It's hard. I was a child of a rabbi, and it wasn't easy for me. But I just want you to know that your father helps people in a very profound way. And a lot of people respect him and care for him and appreciate him. So you have to share him, I know, and I know it's hard. But he's a great man, and you're blessed to have such extraordinary parents. I want to add something else. The arrival of a new Rav and the arrival of our new Rav is a celebration for our shul, but it's also a mechaev for our shul. It imposes obligations on each one of us as members and friends of our kehillah. The Meshachachma asks an incredible question. How is it possible that Moshe Rabbeinu could have broken the luchos? How could that be? He was just at the top of the mountain. God just gave the luchos to him. It's God's luchos. It's michta velokim. God just wrote it. God just handed it to him. It's suffused with divinity. He comes down the mountain. He hears, it comes to his attention that the Jews are misbehaving. Okay, don't give it to them. They don't deserve it. But to smash it? To break it? Wrap it in a talus, give it a hug and a kiss, put it down at the side of the mountain, go down and scream bloody murder at the Jewish people. Where do you come off breaking the luchos? It's an Eisen Akasha. And the Meshachachma says something profoundly important. Va'al Tadamu, he says, don't even begin to imagine. Ki ha-mikdash va-ha-mishkan hema in yanim kedoshim me'atzmam. I'm going to use now my language. There are two kinds of sanctity. There is what I call intrinsic or inherent sanctity, and there is what I want to call contingent sanctity. Intrinsic sanctity means that this is a hefts of kedusha, that there's holiness in this object. Contingent sanctity means that this object is holy only to the extent to which it's treated that way. It's not intrinsically, inherently holy. It's contingent upon how someone else or a group of people relate to this object. Says the Meshach there's no such thing in the world as anything that has intrinsic or inherent sanctity. al Damu, don't even imagine. Ki ha-mikdosh, not the beis ha-mikdosh, not the mishkan, hema in yanim kedoshim e'atzmam. 
ויוסי מזה הלוכוס, yeah you're right, it's מכתב אלוקים, גם הם אינם קדושים בעצם רק בשבילכם, do you know why the לוכוס are holy? It's because the Jewish people are supposed to live their lives in accordance with the לוכוס, because this is a blueprint for our lives, for the way we live ourselves. That's why it's important. ואין בהם קדושה מצד עצמם רק בשבילכם שאתם שומרים או שם סוף דבר. The end of the day, the only thing that has intrinsic holiness we don't begin to understand this is the Rabbanu Shalom himself. What did Moshe Rabbeinu break? He didn't break the luchos. He broke a clod of clay. It was nothing. It was a lump. At this point, it lost everything. The Jews are ready to serve the golden calf. So what's the luchos? A garnish. So he dropped it. It's not holy, it's not divine, there's nothing in it. It's all contingent upon how the Jewish people relate to it. What a gift HaKadosh Baruch Hu has given our Kehillah, what a bracha we have in our Kehillah. We're blessed with a great rabbi, but we need to be a great Kehillah. Without a committed and involved Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu has nothing. This is the big moment. Moshe Rabbeinu, he comes down 40 days. And if the Jews aren't there, the whole thing is worthless. The luchos are meaningless. There is no Moshe Rabbeinu without the people. You want sanctity? We want sanctity in our personal lives, at home, in our kehila. We need to sanctify it. We need to be Mekadesh. Shem Shamayim. It's not Yenem, it's not someone else, but our Kehillah needs to step up. And we need to appreciate what our responsibility is at this very special moment. We need a partner with our rabbi. We need to support our rabbi. We need to appreciate our rabbi and to give our rabbi the space to be able to lead us in ways that he and only he knows is best for us. Today we celebrate a partnership between an amazing Kehillah. We are so blessed, our family, 16 years already, we're here in Rinat. What a bracha. We're celebrating a partnership between an extraordinary, talented, gifted, kind, learned, and sensitive rabbi and a great community. It's a time for Akara Satov. I want to thank Seymour Adler and the members of the Shona Rishona Committee for working very hard to make sure that this transition works well. And Bino already thanked Ari, but I also want to thank Ari Mermelstein. I know that we would not be here today, and it's a very simple statement, but it's a very true statement. We would not be here today without Ari Mermelstein. The members of the search committee, but in particular Ari Mermelstein, and I don't want to embarrass him particularly Ari Mermelstein, who is an extraordinary Osek, our community is blessed with such leaders. In conclusion, and in inviting Rabbi Strachler to speak to us, I want to borrow from the Nusach of the Mereshus that we recite when we call a chasen Torah to the Torah on Simchas Torah. May it be the will of the Rabboni Shalom. To bestow life and kindness and the crown. Who is our new rabbi. Rinat Yisrael. La'amtso, to strengthen him, levorcho, to bless him. Ulegadlo betal matora, and to make him great, is already great, even greater, in the study and in the teaching of Torah. Lidorsho l'chaim, to seek him out for life. His name is Chaim. Lahadro to glorify him. Levado b'chabura, to establish him within our community. Lizakoso to give him zuchusim and merit. L'chayoso, to give him life. L'takso, b'teches, ora, 
to place him in the council of the light, the aura of Torah. Liashro lechalalo, to give him and grant him virtue and even greater virtue and distinction. Lelamdo lekachusvara, to teach him logic and to teach him wisdom, even more that he already has. Lamalto to protect him. Lenaso to raise him. Lesado besad berura, and to give him much support. Laadno to delight him, lefarnaso to provide for him. Litzatko ba'amnivra to make him righteous among the people for whom the world was created. Lakarvo to draw him near, lerachmo to show him mercy. Ulashamro mikol tsuka vitsara and to protect him from any distress and any trouble. L'takfo, to strengthen him. L'samcho, to assist him. L'samcho beruach nishbara, to support him when the going gets rough. Amod, amod, amod. Morenu verabenu harav chaim bin yamen ben rab Yitzchak David verifka hinda. V'sein kavod l'kel gadol vinora as an expression of honor to the great and awesome God. And in this merit, that we have merited. You should be from the holy God. It's one thing to be a great rabbi. It's another thing to be a great father, a great parent. We want the best for our kehila. We want the best for your family. That you should be zoche, together with Avital. Liros banim uvenei banim oskim batoro mekaime mitzvos. Besoch am yafo uvara, among God's beautiful and refined people. Vesiske lesmoach besimchas beis habechira. You should be zoche. We should all be zoche to rejoice in the binyan beis hamikdash. Mirishus kol hakahol hakadosh hazeh, with the permission of our entire kehila, I invite you now, Rab Chaim, Amod, 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 Moreinu verabenu, Rab Chaim ben Yamin ben Rab Yitzchak David, verifka hinda, to become our Marada Asra. Please welcome Rabbi Chaim Strach. Ashrenu, how fortunate we are to be alive in this moment. I am so humbled by the beautiful words that were shared just moments ago. I'm so happy to be able to be the Rav of this Kihila. I'm so fortunate to have the Rabbanim and the Chaverim that I do I'm so fortunate to be the son and grandson and great-grandson that I am. I'm so happy to be the father that I am. I'm so proud to be a Jew. I'm so proud to be a modern Orthodox Jew. I'm so proud to be a Renat Jew. I'd like to thank Rabbi Adler and Cheryl for their work in creating the pulpits that I am so privileged to stand in front of. A pulpit is not just a piece of wood, but it's a reflection of the values that are imbued and that are expressed before it. And the Torah that Rabbi Adler and Cheryl have created within this community are the Torah upon which I and every future rabbi of this congregation will be able to teach. I'd like to thank my parents 
for the example and the home of Torah that they have raised me within and the values that they have passed on to me and to my siblings. Their example in terms of their commitments to Torah and to the world are the foundation of everything that I am. And I'm so appreciative. I want to thank Avital, my wife, my strength, that everything that I have achieved as a rabbi is a function of her, her work. I get all the credit, she does all the work. I feel so fortunate to be able to have your support and your love and the strength that you give me every day is the basis of everything that I am able to accomplish. And finally and ultimately, I'd like to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Shechiyanu v'kimanu v'giyanu l'zman hazeh, that in thinking about what it means to be a person, what it means to be a creature here within this world, is to be able to see the goodness and the greatness that surrounds us, that to be able to breathe, to be able to, to see the sunshine, to be able to experience the goodness that surrounds us. What are we? We are here only by the blessings of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And to be able to take a step back at moments like this one and to be able to really appreciate what life is, is to be able to see the bracha of being able to live in the world that we do in God's world. Bina mentioned earlier as did Rav Schachter our appreciation for to Ari Mermelstein's work in um, facilitating this day. And I'd like to echo those sentiments but I'd like to, to follow up with one of the questions that Ari posed to me at uh, the Prabha Shabbos here in this room. He asked me then if I could live in any moment of Jewish history, what moment would I live in? And I, at that time, I said, I'd like to live now. I'd like to live right now, to which Ari appropriately said, well, other than now, what, which moment would you like to live in? And uh, I'm sure it's still uh, recorded somewhere and you can see my answer to that question. But um, I'd like to really dwell upon this question, the question of what it means to be alive right now with the opportunities that we have, Ashrein, how fortunate we are. And it is a great zuchut the great merit to be alive and to not just simply be alive, but to be alive here in this room, the opportunities that we have to be part of this kihila, to be part of this community. And we come from a long chain, a long legacy that brings us to this moment. And I'd like to spend a couple of moments reflecting upon that legacy that um, we as Jews, we as modern Orthodox Jews, we as Renat Jews carry. And I'd like to argue and claim and to appreciate that that comes from Avram Avinu, whose legacy we carry. And I'd like to read with you a midrash that describes Avram Avinu. And it's a classic midrash that I'm sure that almost everyone here is familiar with. But I'd like to, to note and carefully uh, appreciate the connections within this Midrash to two stories that you may not be as aware of. The Midrash Rabbah and Bereshis and Ta Perak Lamed Chet speaks about Avraham Avinu's uh, business in his father's idol shop. And we're very familiar with uh, the story that a person comes into Avram's shop 
and asks to buy an idol. And Avram responds and says, how old are you? And the man says, well, I'm, I'm 50 years old. And he says, how can it be that a person who's 50 years old would want to buy an idol that was created today? And so this individual is shamed and storms out of the shop. And then tells another story of a woman who comes to the idol shop with some flour to offer as a sacrifice to the idols and um, asks that it be brought before the idols. And this is the, the famous story where Avram puts it in front of the idols and he goes ahead and destroys and breaks the various idols, the ultimate iconoclast, breaks those idols. And Avram Avinu, when asked about how this happened, well, he says that the food was put out in front of the idols, and the idols said, no, I'm going to take, I'm going to take. And sure enough, the biggest idol smashed all the other idols. To with his father, upon seeing this, says, that can't be, that doesn't work, that's not the way idols actually operate. And uh, brings Avram Avinu before Nimrod, who is the king of the time. And here's where the story goes off in a slightly different tact. And uh, it's this connection which I'd like to underline here this morning. That he's brought before Nimrod, and um, he says, Nimrod says to him, um, what God exactly are, is it that you worship? What is this that you're behind? What's going on here, Avraham? And Avraham says in response, Why are we worshiping this specific god of fire that you, Nimrod, worship? Let's rather worship the god of water, which quenches fire. So Nimrod says, fine, so let's worship water. To which Avram says, well, let's rather worship the clouds, which bear the water. And Avram says in response to this, well, why should we worship the clouds then? If Nimrod agrees to worship the clouds, let's worship the wind that disperses the clouds. So Nimrod says, fine. So let's worship the wind in that case. To which Avram says, let's worship human beings which can stand up to the wind. And so Nimrod says, fine. Let's worship human beings which can stand up to the wind. And finally, Nimrod says, you're just banding around words. We'll worship nothing but the fire. And I will cast you into that fire and see what your God will do to you within that moment. Here within this Midrash, we find two stories. The story of Avraham within his father's shop, and we have the story of Nimrod and his uh, theological disputes with Avraham Avinu. And within these two stories, I believe there's something parallel. There is the parallel between theology, the beliefs that we have about God, and also our politics, how it is that we relate to one another. And in Nimrod's discussion, the story concludes with Avram Avinu being cast into the fire because he will not play Nimrod's games. He will not accept this whole convention of worshiping one God over another. We often imagine Avram as an iconoclast who breaks his father's idols, but we don't appreciate that Avram's actually arguing something with Nimrod and with Terach, with his father, about the nature of God and the nature of human life. And that is that in breaking the idols of his shop, Avram is actually making a statement about the operations of the world as a whole. And if I can summarize Avraham's argument, it goes something like this. Why is the world so broken? Why is it that so much goes wrong around us? Why is it that we face so many problems? And classically, there are two approaches to answer this problem. One approach is to say that there are multiple forces within this world that do battle with one another. And it is our task as human beings to pick one force and to champion it over the other forces 
and thereby reach the ultimate good. There are forces of evil and forces of good. And it is for us to choose the forces of good that will somehow defeat the forces of evil and make our world that much better. That, in a very philosophical way, is what idolatry is all about. It is to say that the force of fire, the force of the wind, the force of water is the key force. And if only we are to call our attention to that one force, we'll be able to gain peace and goodness by virtue of that devotion. Avram Avinu, by contrast, takes a different view on the matter. Avram Avinu says that, in fact, there is no war. Ultimately, all the disparate forces that surround us all unite. And ultimately, the choice that Nimrod pushes before him is a false choice that we need not make. In the end, a Kaddish Baruch Hu unifies everything. There is one God. There is no requirement to pick one over another. This is what we call ethical monotheism. And there are ethics which emerge from this theology because if in fact we're not required to choose one force over another, we need not destroy those people who believe in one thing over another because ultimately we all come together. Ultimately it all makes sense within God's larger vision. As a Jewish people, we bring this idea from Avram Avinu throughout our history. We speak not about the forces of good forcing, facing the forces of evil, the fire and the water. Rather, we speak about Hashem who unifies it all. And that within all the problems, all the challenges, and all the things that go wrong within life, there is a harmony. There's something which holds it all together. And that's something that we champion. And likewise, when it comes to what it means to be a Jew within our worlds, we as modern Orthodox Jews, we as Renat Jews, champion this idea as well in not being required to make choices between this or that. Rather, we hold together a vision of our people and of our world, which sees the good with people on either side of wherever it is that we stand. That we're able to hold it all together to see the divine unity in the face of those who would seek to pit one against another. And likewise, in this moment within our society, where there is so much politics of us versus them, we proudly say that there is more that unites us than what divides us. E plubis unum. We proudly declare that there is no true need to pick a horse within whatever horse race we are watching. And even when we might pick such a horse, we recognize at the end that the race itself is just a game. It's just a means of entertainment, but ultimately, we as a society, we as people, we as people of faith, appreciate the ultimate harmony that surrounds us, that we have the fortunate ability to enjoy, to celebrate. This is a great zuchut to be able to bring this philosophy into the world around us, to be able to celebrate and to cherish the good of those around us and to be able to see that good within ourselves. Because ultimately this is something which extends beyond politics and theology, but really relates to the very person ourselves and how it is that we relate to ourselves and to the many parts of who we are. That just as a person can break apart 
a society or break apart an idol. There also is the opportunity to break apart a person. And we say that that's not ultimately what Kodesh Baruch Hu wants from us, but rather that we have within us something which is whole, something which is useful, something which is a part of God's world that ultimately has meaning and ultimately has the greatest of purpose. This is the source of my pride. This is the source of the flag that I carry as a student of Avram Avinu. It's something that makes me proud to be a Jew. It's something that makes me proud to be a modern Orthodox Jew. It's something that makes me proud to be a Renat Jew. Ashrenu, we are so lucky to be alive right now. Ashrenu, how fortunate we are to be able to have the opportunities that we do to be alive within this moment. I would like to just conclude with one last reflection. And that's to reflect upon the, the many kind words that were shared earlier by Rabbi Tarragon, by Rabbi Adler, and Rabbi Schachter. As proud as I am, as proud as we all must be, in moments like this one, we also feel a certain katonti, a certain feeling that the blessing, the thankfulness that we have, something is that beyond anything that we deserve. And that's certainly something that I feel in this moment. And the katonti is not simply about the words, but the katonti is also a function of the relationships that we share within these moments. I feel so fortunate to be able to be here with you, to be able to work with you in this moment of our people's history, to be Jews who have a mission within our Jewish world and within the wider world. I feel so fortunate to be able to share this mission with this kihila, with this community, and all that it represents and all the kochot that it has within it. We're going to do amazing things together. And I will only be able to do anything that I'm able to do because of the strength that we share, because of each of the people that you are, and the whole that we're able to create together. If we are to carry the legacy of Avram Havinu, it is only through being the people that Yaakov and Yitzchak created from Avraham. It's only by the strength that we receive from the chain of teachers and parents that bring us to this moment. And it's only through the legacy that we're able to continue to pass on that we're able to do what we do. To be able to feel that intergenerational connection, to be able to feel the um, connections that we share within a kihila of chesed, a kihila of Torah, a kihila of mitzvot. May we be privileged to stand. Amod, amod, amod. It's not just Chaim, Ben Yamin, Ben Yitzchak, David, Verifka Hinda who stands, but it is all of us who stand. And we stand upon the um, strength of those who came before us. And it is our standing that will be the basis through which those who stand after us will be able to follow in our footsteps. Ashrenu, be proud. Be proud to be Jews. Be proud to be modern Orthodox Jews. Be proud to be Rina Jews. Thank you. Now we have one last speaker. I'd like to call up our, our, our assembly women. Assembly women, uh, please. Thank you. Our assembly women elect. elect. Good morning. My name is Shama Heder. I'm the assembly woman elect for District 37, of which TNEC is a part. And I'm 
totally honored to be here on such a wonderful occasion. I'm here representing the legislative district and the Senate and the legislature who have tasked me to present this le resolution of the joint legislature in honor of the installation of Rabbi Chaim Strackler. It's my honor to be here. I'll just read a little bit from it. Oh, don't have my glasses, sorry. <laughs> The, the Senate and the General Assembly of the State of New Jersey are pleased to honor and salute Rabbi Chaim Strachler, a highly esteemed member of his community, upon the felicitous occasion of his installation ceremony. And it goes on to state that this legislature hereby co co commends Rabbi Chaim Strachler, pays tribute to his meritorious record of service, leadership, and commitment, and extends Sincere best wishes for continued success in all his future endeavors. It is my privilege to present this resolution and to add my felicitations to it. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for attending. This now concludes our event. Please join us downstairs from, for some light refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.